On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome His Excellency Mohammed Irfan Ali, President of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana, and to invite him to address the Assembly. Mr. President, please accept my warm congratulations on your election to the presidency of the General Assembly for its 78th session. I assure you of Guyana's full support as you carry out your responsibilities. I also take this opportunity to express our appreciation to His Excellency Shaba Kursi, Kurosi for his leadership as President of the 77th Session of the General Assembly. I join those before me in expressing Guyana's solidarity with the governments and peoples of Libya and Morocco in the wake of the recent devastating flood and earthquake. The theme of this year's assembly recognizes the need for us to collectively reset global relationships and imbue them with enhanced trust and solidarity. Only in doing so can we aspire to confront the most pressing challenges of our era. Climate change, conflicts, the energy and food crisis, and achieving sustainable development. I remain convinced that multilateralism remains the most effective approach to address these challenges, foremost of which is climate change. We are all experiencing its devastating effects. The difference, however, is our capacity to respond. It is well established that those bearing the brunt of the climate phenomena have made no contribution to the current crisis. Small island developing and low-lying coastal states like Guyana are among the hardest hit and require adequate financing to address the attendant effects. The commitments by, developed world, by the developed countries, including the pledge of US $100 billion per year, remain unfulfilled. How much longer must developing countries wait for these commitments to be fully delivered? Although at net zero emissions, Guyana continues to pursue growth premise on a low carbon development strategy. Our goal is to ensure that our resources are utilized sustainably to foster inclusive and equitable development for our people. As a country with the second highest forest cover per capita in the world, we know the importance of forests in mitigating the effects of climate change at a global level. Our advocacy in this re regard has resulted in Guyana being issued 33.4 million tons of carbon credits, the first jurisdictional scale program in the world. Thus far, we have secured 750 million US dollars for the period 2016 to 2030. Guyana is committed to a clean energy transition. We're aiming for over 80% reliance on renewable energy by 2030. Technology, capacity, and financing are key for developing countries to build a relevant energy mix and a share of renewable energy needed. Guyana is using revenue from oil and gas resources to finance its transition to renewable energy, notwithstanding our already globally recognized net zero status. Allow me to expound on the critical question of a just affordable and equitable transition. Bloomberg estimates that achieving global net zero emissions by 2050 requires annual investments to more than triple from the 2021 level to $6.7 trillion per year. To limit the rise of global temperature to less than two degrees Celsius, the IEA estimates that investment in the energy, that investment in the energy sector alone will have to be increased by approximately $1 trillion annually. At the same time, in developing countries, the situation is more frightening. With close to 900 million people worldwide having no access to electricity, all of this against the backdrop of a widening financing gap 
in achieving the SDGs. An adaptation al with adaptation alone, estimated at 160 to 340 billion dollars by 2030, and 315 billion to 565 billion dollars by 2050, according to UNEP. More than 90 countries have committed to net zero emissions. To achieve this, the IEA estimates that by 2050, more than 85% of buildings must be net zero carbon ready. More than 90% heavy industrial production must be low emissions, and almost 70% of electricity will have to come from solar photovoltaic. Based on these targets, renewable share in the generation of electricity will have to increase from 29% in 2020 to 88% in 2050. Meanwhile, to remove carbon from the atmosphere, the world will need to simultaneously halt deforestation and increase tree cover gain two times faster by 2030. This means by 2050, 7.6 gigatons of carbon will have to be captured and stored compared to 0.4 gigatons in 2020. According to McKenzie and company, it would cost $375 trillion in cumulative spending on physical asset to transition to, z to net zero by 2050. Mr. President, the question is, under these circumstances, how realistic is the transition path to net zero? It is clear that the global ambition of net zero by 2050 is not currently realistic given the costs of transition and the financing commitment thus far. I say all of this not to reduce ambition, but for us to honestly and frankly direct our energies to a more balanced approach towards net zero in a realistic environment. My country, Guyana, is blessed with the best of both worlds. That is the ability to lead on climate change and the use of our expansive oil and gas reserves to contribute to the advancement and development of our country and region. But let me hasten to add, Mr. President, COP28 will not achieve the desired objectives of definitively putting our planet on a net zero trajectory if we continue to address this matter in a doctrinarian way, ignoring the current realities. Given the growth in demand for energy, a significant part of that demand will come from many in the developing world who continue to live in energy poverty. It is also a fact that renewables will not meet the growth of demand in the near future. If the debate at COP28 is framed by two camps, one calling for no cuts in fossil fuel production, including the most polluting form, such as coal, and the other saying that the only solution to net zero is an end to fossil fuel product production, then we'll fail once again to achieve a viable outcome and not to give our world the energy it needs to grow and prosper. I believe that net zero by 2050 as a target can only be achieved by a combination of measures that include a cut in fossil fuel production, incentivizing the introduction of renewables at scale, exploring advances in technology, in using carbon cap capture and storage, cutting deforestation and land degradation, and introducing measures to curb demand for energy. As custodians of the rainforest, the size of England and Scotland combined, we are of the view that the lack of financing for standing forests suggests they are worth more dead than alive. That is why we support the expansion of a financial mechanism that appropriately value the environmental services provided by forests, including through the carbon market. We are at the midpoint of implementing the 2030 Agenda. Our global blueprint for sustainable and resilient development Financing is a cornerstone of all efforts to achieve the SDGs and the challenges faced by developing countries, including the funding gaps, which I highlighted in the SDG Summit commitments. 
including those made 50 years ago, to provide 0.7% of GNI in ODA must be fulfilled. The existing financial architecture is incapable of addressing current global challenges and must be reformed. In this regard, the early adoption of the multidimensional vulnerability index, implementing the measures in the Bridgetown Initiative, and addressing liquidity support, private capital, development lending, trade, and more inclusive governance of the international financial institutions must form part of the reform agenda. Mr. President, the world is presently experiencing a global food crisis marked by soaring food prices, heightened food insecurity, and increasing levels of hunger. Conflict, climate change, and effects of the pandemic contribute to this dire state. Approximately 198 million people in 26 least developed countries face severe food insecurity since the beginning of 2022. Due to rising food prices and trade restrictions, this situation has worsened. By 2030, it is estimated that nearly 670 million people, equivalent to 8% of the global population, will suffer from undernourishment. Global agri-food system must be urgently transformed to ensure they are more resilient and that nutritious food is affordable for all. We also condemn the weaponization of food as an instrument of war. Guyana welcomes the convening of the three high-level meetings on health and the important commitments in the political declarations. But we must together move rapidly to the implement to implementation if we are to achieve universal health coverage for all and be adequately prepared for future pandemics. Guyana has already made tremendous strides on the path to universal health coverage. In so doing, we have increased our health spending per capita by 64% in the last three years. Mr. President, global peace is hinged on respect and human dignity. Our work at all levels must advance the dignity and rights of every person on our planet to create a just, equitable, and peaceful world. We have noted that since the war began in Ukraine more than a year ago, the, de the developed world provided approximately $220 billion in support to Ukraine. The World Bank has added more than $37.5 billion in emergency financing almost $260 billion mobilized in less than two years. On the other hand, aid to the Palestinian people over a period of 26 years amounted to just over $40 billion, according to figures compiled by the OECD. Haiti received just, just over $20 billion in aid for reconstruction and development over the past 60 years. African countries, or recipients of just over $113 billion over a three-year period to fight hunger, according to the OECD. To be clear, Guyana unequivocally supports the principle of sovereignty and territorial integrity as enshrined in the UN Charter and remains in full sol solidarity with the people of Ukraine and what they justly require from the international community. However, I cannot overlook the disparity in the approach to other countries and regions of the world. This must be corrected. Clearly, this is a demonstration of an unjust ecosystem surrounding and supporting development financing, peace, and security. Importantly, it also proves that if truly committed, mechanisms do exist to unlock financing at scale. Mr. President, adherence to the rule of law including international law, must continue to be the cornerstone of all of our engagements. This is being undermined by threats and naked acts of aggression against sovereign states and by the perpetuation of all conflicts and disputes between states. The Russian invasion must end. Greater diplomatic efforts must be made to bring an end to this war. The ongoing crisis in Haiti is of grave concern. Urgent and decisive action must be taken 
to secure a comprehensive solution. I commend the offer of the governments of Kenya and Rwanda to lead the multinational force in Haiti, as well as the offers by the Bahamas and Jamaica. Guyana is committed to working closely with partners within the UN and CARICOM frameworks to find a long-lasting, stable, and sustainable solution to the Haitian crisis so that our Haitian brothers and sisters can live in peace and dignity. The Republic of Cuba has been the object of aggressive has been the object of aggression for more than six decades. We repeat our call for the dismantling of the unaccept unacceptable embargo against our sister Caribbean state. The economic and political aggression, along with the designation of Cuba as a state sponsor of terrorism, must come to an end. I also reaffirm Ghana's long-standing solidarity with the Palestinian people and support for their dignified existence in their homeland in accordance with the two-state solution. As member states of the United Nations, let us do more to move past rhetoric so that the peace process can progress. Mr. President, when I addressed the OAS last Friday, I recalled to that hemispheric body how Guyana was excluded from the OAS for 25 years from its birth as a nation on account of a spurious territorial claim to two-thirds of our homeland by Venezuela. But justice prevailed, and Guyana was ultimately admitted. It is sad, however, that 57 years after Guyana's independence, we remain threatened. Venezuela's efforts to undermine our freedom, sovereignty, and territorial integrity are today before the International Court of Justice. As decided by the UN Secretary General under the Geneva Agreement of 1966, the ICJ's jurisdiction in the matter has been twice affirmed by the court. We are confident that Guyana's sovereignty and territorial integrity will also be affirmed when the court issues its final judgment. I regret to inform you that Venezuela's threats continue. Just last night, Guyana received a very threatening message from Venezuela. It came in the form of a communique attacking Guyana for putting certain oil blocks in our sovereign waters up for bid. Guyana considers this a threat to regional and international peace and security, as well as to Guyana's investment partners. We demand that Venezuela honors its obligation under the Charter to pursue only peaceful means to settle any disputes it may have with Guyana, including adjudication before the International Court of Justice. Allowing the court to decide would ensure a resolution that is peaceful, equitable, and in accordance with international law. Guyana will spare no effort in defending its sovereign and territorial integrity. I express appreciation to every member of the international community that has continued to support Guyana's effort to, to preserve its sovereignty and territorial integrity. Mr. President, as Guyana takes its place next January as a member of the Security Council, those principles of international law and justice, so prominent in the charter of this organization, shall be our guide. And so, I express heartfelt gratitude to the overwhelming support of member states to our candidature to the United Nations Security Council for the 2024-2025 term. I wish to assure the entire UN membership that Guyana is committed to working with fellow Council members and the wider UN membership to fulfill, to fulfill the mandate of the Security Council. Mr. President, as I reflect on the state of growing insecurity in the world, let me also reiterate the calls made by CARICOM for the early and urgent reform of the United Nations Security Council to make it more effective and inclusive. September, Mr. President, September is the month dedicated to indigenous people in my country. We are aware that globally, indigenous peoples are often left behind. Not so in Guyana. My government is investing heavily in indigenous peoples' development, ensuring their inclusion and participation in decision-making at all levels. Our land titling program has resulted in, the, in indigenous peoples obtaining legal ownership of 16.4% of Guyana's land mass. In addition to regular government investment, 
15% of all proceeds from the sale of carbon credits go directly to indigenous villages to finance their development. Guyana is the first country to implement such an initiative. We are proud of our record and stand ready to share our experiences. Mr. President, allow me to conclude by renewing Guyana's solidarity with the peoples of the world, our commitment to multilateralism, our readiness to partner with states large and small in the quest for peace and prosperity for all. I thank you. On behalf of the Assembly, I wish to thank the President of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana for the statement just made, and I request protocol to escort His Excellency. The Assembly will hear an address by His Excellency.